Welcome to ACM. We're in London, United Kingdom today, and our guest is Hunter Cumming Shaw. Hunter is American, born and raised in the mountains of Vermont, where he was homeschooled until the day he finally enrolled in the Putney School at the age of 15. Hunter is an extraordinary and unconventional art researcher who spends much of his time meeting and gathering stories from artists of all walks of life, mainly in the East and Southeast Asian regions. The archive he has been developing, called Curti, already includes hundreds of artists, oftentimes never represented in mainstream art scenes. Hunter's mission is to develop Curti into an alternative art publishing practice that is open sourced and serves as a countermeasure to art world silos and stratifications. You can find a link to his project in the description. Hunter is also a grandson of two cultural icons of mid-century America. Mark Shaw, the brilliant fashion photographer who took striking and personal images of the Kennedy family, Audrey Hepburn, Dior, and many more. And Pat Suzuki, a pioneering Japanese-American Broadway singer who was famously featured on the cover of Time magazine. But most importantly, Hunter is a beloved friend of mine. He was also my first ever business partner when we started an ice cream brand called Elm Lee during our studies at the Putney School at the age of 18. If you wish to watch our visual podcast in full, find us at Asian Changemakers on YouTube. Here's Hunter Cumming Shaw. When I first was starting with the project, I was, um, I wanted to make a publication or some sort of uh, magazine that was showing contemporary art practice uh, in the region in a um, really visual oriented way, very conversational, very visual, non-academic, experimental, playful, and so I was just gathering uh, images that artists were giving me of their work or images, again, that I was making of their studios or of their practice um, and also conversations I was having with them. And I was gathering this material and I was approaching uh, publishers and museums in the West for funding. Um, but I quickly realized that art funding, art publishing is a very difficult business and there's no money in it. And even if I were to publish something, uh, I wouldn't be able to bring it into Southeast Asia because of uh, censorship uh, laws in different countries. Um, and it was important that artists could talk about whatever they wanted and show whatever work they wanted. Uh, often this work, um, they couldn't publish in, in their own country, but, but uh, I, I wanted to you know, talk about it. I wanted to share it. Thirdly, even if it could be published in their own country, no one could afford to buy it because printing all, you know, color photographs in a book, in a, a large format magazine is very expensive if it's a small print run. And uh, people in the art scene don't have money to be buying, you know, $50, $60 coffee table books or, or whatever it was. But I realized that they were my first audience, is the people I were meeting were really curious to learn about the other artists that I had been meeting. And actually, as small as the art scene was, people were quite disconnected from each other. Mm. And it seemed like the first audience, or the first way I could give back, is actually just introducing people. As I was being introduced to people, also introducing them to each other. Uh, especially across countries, especially across disciplines, because I was trying to meet everybody, painters, photographers, sculptors. I was also meeting uh, photojournalists, academics, people a bit outside of the contemporary art scene, but who I was just getting introduced to. And so uh, during COVID, I changed the orientation of the project and got more interested in self-publishing and zine cultures, and I started... Um, well, I had made this uh, for an art fair that was professionally printed. Um, I had I had made a big book to bring to publishers. It was three. It was a uh, uh, three hundred pages. It was fifty different artists. It cost me like two hundred dollars or two hundred and fifty dollars to print one book. I, I made like five of them just to give to some museums and to some publishers. It was so expensive to print, and then I printed up like two or three hundred copies of this little. Uh, catalog which I was just giving to curators as a you know 
little gift that showed 50 different artists that I had met. But then after the art fair, and then COVID happened, and after the art fair, I, um, while I was at you know in quarantine, in lockdown for COVID, I th was thinking about it, and I said, my God, this format is so much cheaper and easier to produce. It's just A4 paper folded in half and stapled. What if I were to make the entire project just using this format? Um, and if I did that, I could produce it in the country wherever I was. I could produce it in Thailand or in Cambodia, in Myanmar, um, not have to bring anything into the country, not ha have to have it be legally published or officially published, have it be really, really economical and just print these up one little booklet for one artist or one interview or one conversation, sort of a series of growing a little um, notebooks and give them to the artists that I'm meeting, give them to the curators I'm meeting, and then eventually partner with the art spaces that are each acting as little hubs in different regions, partner with the art spaces for them to print these up themselves and then they could sell them at cost just to print, you know, so very, very cheaply have them available a little bit under the radar to artists or curators or enthusiasts who are coming through their art space. So sort of working within the limitations that I was finding economically um, and and to do with censorship and everything else to, to try to get information into people's hands um, and have it be really flexible and have it be ad hoc, have it be, you know, guerrilla style. So that's that's what I've been doing is making this little series of booklets um, with conversations and, you know, drafting a, a number of different ones on different people that I'm meeting and then talking to different art spaces about them ho hosting this series. I'm also building an online present, you know, an online platform, but because some of this information is a bit sensitive, I need to be careful about what's too accessible online. It's safer to have something at an art space where the people there know sort of who they're giving it to and everything is quite like one-to-one, -one, which is sort of what the project is about, meeting people, having conversations, building that trust one-to-one. -one. So it's starting very small scale and really just about those uh, personal direct relationships. So give us an idea of how many different kinds of artists that you've met over the, the past few years you've started this project and what have you learned about the contemporary art <clears throat> scene in the region? I guess the first thing I'd say is that I explained the project as about Southeast Asia because that's where I've been traveling around. But in reality, the project is about a certain methodology of working through introductions from peer to peer, friend to friend, and really tracing those communities that emerge through these introductions. It so happens that it started in Vietnam because I was studying in Singapore and then went to Vietnam. And so the people I've been meeting have all been in mainland Southeast Asia so far. However, I don't want the project to come across as making some sort of uh, judgment or statement about the art scenes in an authoritative way. I am not an expert. I'm not trying to speak on behalf of anyone else. Uh, I only do interviews with people, ask them questions, listen to their answers. I don't write about the artists at all. Um, I'm not picking who's good or who's bad. So it's a delicate line or delicate balance. Uh, I don't want to make any claims about the art scenes or about, you know, this is what Vietnam is like. This is what Southeast Asia is like. Um, I also don't know a lot about the art scenes in other countries. Uh, my background's not in art. Um, in college, I was studying mostly literature and philosophy. I got interested in contemporary art right at the end. S um, but maybe there's a more s specific question you wanted to ask, or I don't know if... Well, how many interactions do you think you've had so far? Um, I mean, you've been meeting so many different types of artists from all different walks of life, and what have you learned from, from those encounters so far? 
I would say that generally because the art scenes I've been um, moving around, and again, really, so far that's only been Thailand, Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam, um, there is not a lot of money in the art scene. There's not a lot of support, funding. There's not a lot of collectors. There's not a lot of institutions um, supporting the arts. There's a lot of censorship. You can really get into trouble with the government for making art that criticizes the government or criticizes aspects of society. So many of the artists that I've met have spent time in jail or have to be very careful about what they show. Um, so there's no real, and it's not, people don't understand in the society so much about art or contemporary art especially. And so it's not a cool thing to do. There's no um, celebrity status from being an artist. Um, there's no real benefit or draw to go into contemporary art. So the people that are doing it are very earnest and very uh, sincere, and they're doing it because it really, really means something to them. And for me, that's very beautiful against all those odds and against, you know, my criticism of some of the art that I see or some of the... I, I went to art school briefly in the West. Um, I had the sense that people were being artists sometimes because of they wanted a certain lifestyle or they wanted a certain cachet or it was just a very cool thing to do to be an artist and there wasn't much at stake you could sort of say anything or do anything uh, in a contemporary art context in the west and everyone sort of rolls their eyes it's been done before nothing really happens but you know in a place like you know Myanmar a place like Thailand uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, really it's a dicey, you know, things are on the line and the, the governments take contemporary art very seriously, which is sort of an amazing thing to see. They take it very seriously because they, um, they censor it and you censor things which you believe have some power to undermine authority. And so it's quite, you know, awe-inspiring to see these places where it's like wow they actually think art you know for good or for bad can do something uh powerful so it's an interesting space to be working in even though it's quite uh, the scenes are quite small and people are just you know starting out developing um in the last maybe 10 15 years really so being mindful of um the sensitivity of some of the artists and the arts that you've come across so far. Um, is there an artist that you can you can talk about, you can share with us, uh, an encounter uh, that um, is memorable to you to give us an idea of sort of what sort of artists you have in meeting and, and uh, telling stories of, collecting stories of? Sure. Well, one artist who I met with in the beginning of my travels um, is a painter from uh, Myanmar, from Yangon, who's of a, he was a older generation um, painter in a surrealist tradition, and he had made a, a, a body of work about his time in prison. He was uh, part of a youth uh, protest um, against the government and had spent some years in prison because of that, and he was painting the series of scenes from prison life, people eating, sleeping, um, interactions with guards, but with these vivid colors and sort of symbolic, strange elements. Anyway, I'd been introduced to him when I was in Yangon and went over to his studio. Um, I didn't have a camera. I had my phone on me and the lighting, he didn't have documentation of these paintings and I wanted to document them. Um, but the studio was too dark, so we took out the paintings into the street right outside of his studio, and he just held them up, and I just took pictures of them on my phone, and uh, people were walking by, uh, chickens were walking by, carts were going around, and it was just like really raw and really, you know, not in the white cube of the gallery, 
but in the context of you know where these are coming from and i think for me that captures the spirit of what i'm trying to do and um you know just sort of using whatever means you have around you and just trying to share um what has been the biggest challenge and joy in having gone on this journey so far um in trying to meet and connect uh, people, arts, and stories in these regions? Well, the biggest joy is certainly just meeting many different types of people and being able to have access to these cities or these areas um, in a little different way than as a tourist because I'm meeting locals and I'm meeting really amazing, cool, creative, interesting people who are bringing me to really amazing, cool, interesting places. And so that's an incredible joy and in being able to develop friendships with these folks. Because again, meeting people and then meeting them again and then meeting them again, building that trust over time is um, really what the project's all about. But also being very open, being very open-minded about who I'm meeting, just asking for, again, everyone I meet, asking them to introduce me to someone else who is... Uh, doing something interesting uh, creatively, who's you know in, working in the arts or even an academic or a photojournalist image maker who's telling a story that they feel like is important you know, to share. So that's been the easiest part. The, the most challenging part has been, well, the language barrier is hard, um, but I've been working hard as well um, to surmount that, um, asking friends of friends to translate meetings, um, building up a little network of translators who could help me, and just having slow conversations that can go, you know, uh, at the pace of what people are comfortable with, um, because I certainly do not want to Essentially, the, the, the artists that get known internationally are the artists who speak English fluently and who studied abroad, come from wealthy families. And I, I don't want to focus on them only, but make the effort to talk to other folks who maybe don't have those resources, who don't speak English or don't speak English so confidently. So that's a challenge. Um, but another challenge is that Again, I call myself a researcher and I, and, and I call what I'm doing as, you know, very informal, almost like an oral history, just going around, talking to people, gathering stories, taking images, archiving, um, but really oriented to process and um, things, that, you know, in flux and drafts and all of this messiness. Um, but I have noticed that curators that I meet, uh, people working in the art world who are not artists, um, curators that I meet uh, often can be very disapproving of the project. Very senior established curators, sort of the top dogs, are very supportive and very eager for me to continue and in introducing me right away to big museums or big, you know, other players um, in the West or wherever. So I'm very thankful for that. Younger curators, mid-career curators, they seem to be more territorial. And even though I'm I'm not trying to um, step on their toes, I think me coming into their scene and, and meeting people, moving around, working on something which seems so formless and so aimless, um, they are the people who are quite critical, and they don't introduce me to anyone else. So what are their what are their criticisms like? So they're very unprofessional. They say this is very unprofessional. They say, well, what you should do is you should focus on um, one country, one city, one type of art, one generation. So, for example, painters from Hanoi from the 1990s. And then you should really focus on that and learn all the context and sort of really dive into that. That's fine. That's you know what an academic does. Then I'm writing a book over 10 years about, like, you know, p these couple of people during this couple-year period. But that's not what the project's about at all. Um, my inspiration for the project was initially the Surrealist magazines that was coming out of Paris in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, 
So that playfulness and that sort of openness is the energy for the project, not something hyper-focused and, you know, methodically researched. Um, so it's just a different methodological difference to the curators. Also, I think because I'm, you know, so naive and so, um, my, my methods are, I guess, unconventional in that I'm just happy to go up directly to people and introduce myself. And for, for, for whatever reason, people are really welcoming. Artists are really welcoming. How do you introduce yourself? When you, t when you talk to an artist for the first time, they don't know you. How do you introduce yourself? I would just say, hey, I'm working on this project. Uh, well, I'm always introduced to people by other people. Mm -hmm. So I, I say, hey, I was, uh, your friend so-and-so said that we should meet. Is it okay if, that we meet? I'm working on a project, um, meeting artists in the region, having conversations. People mostly say, yeah, sure, let's meet. Because, you know, it's their friend who's introducing them. So your experience so far has been that the artists, they want to tell their stories and they're happy to share their stories with you. Certainly. Mm. What do you think is the most valuable aspect of the work that you've been doing? I think the conversations I'm having are going to be more interesting the further into the future we go and the further in the past they become. I think that these conversations, which will often be three, four plus hours long and are very unscripted and people talk about their art, but then they start talking about their families and their society and reflections on, you know, how things have changed in their lifetimes. Like that's quite interesting from like a anthropological perspective. And so it's almost like building a collection of stories that are reflecting on certain place at a certain time um, that is rapidly shifting and changing. So I think that's going to be the, the most interesting thing, you know, even beyond the specificities of this artist or even this art scene for this country. What are, what are these artists like? What are, their, what are their backgrounds, their upbringing like? Is there sort of a, a common theme or context to how they became an artist? More than artists being similar to each other, it's often generations of artists being more similar to each other. Mm. So, for example, uh, an older generation of artists are often more conservative or more interested in ideas of like uh, m modernist ideas or, you know, surrealist ideas or sort of more old fashioned, you could say, uh, art making notions. Um, th their approaches are maybe more. Um, yeah, drawing upon a similar set of references and a younger generation of artists might be looking at a totally different set of um, of uh, inspiration. And so, and also growing up maybe around technology more, or growing up in a uh, culture that was more open to the West or more economically developed. So I would say mostly it's the different generations of folks. Uh, you can find differences. Mm. What is the difference between contemporary art and uh, modern art? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Man. <laughs> contemporary art's a fuzzy term. Basically, it's like art that people okay, I, since I'm the curious, 1960s though. have been making. Why do you not like this question? Well, it's very easy to look foolish. So I could say like, okay. what is, what is, what is, uh, can you define Korean culture as different than Chinese culture? Like, Yes, are, I could. The hats are different. So this is how I would say. Sure. First, let's talk about gardens. This is probably the best way to understand the difference between Chinese and Korean culture. <laughs> I'll be very careful of what I have yeah, to say. So. Yeah, so I would say like contemporary art is art mostly from people who've been making it after the 1960s. And modern art is art that people have, you know, were making maybe at the early 20th century uh, until the 50s in, in the West, in America. But again, this is a oversimplification. Um, so when I, when I see art, sure. and I go to, let's say I go to a modern art, 
I go to a because even if you go to a modern art museum, there will there there will be arts that are not just the, modern the art. terms are used very interchangeably yeah. nowadays. Modern and contemporary as words, both in normal language, mean essentially the same thing. Okay, I mean but, I don't really care if something is modern art or contemporary art. I just you know if it's art, it's art. You know, it's in, I, I don't really. You know, I'm, I'm not when I see art, I'm not trying to categorize them into, you know, sure. this discipline. But I guess, you know, because you you also say that you are uh, art researcher, uh, mainly, you know, um, sort of diving into contemporary art scene. And in, in well, I guess, regions, so yeah, I, contemporary art, I mean, is like the, the artists I'm meeting are alive. And the work that they're making is work that's like coming out now. Okay. So that's contemporary because it's mm -hmm. like happening right now. Um, I'm not interested in, in learning about what people were doing. I'm, I'm curious about what people were doing 50 years ago, but um, if I can't meet them, it's not a, really about my project. My project is about what people are doing now. Okay. So that's contemporary. Okay, so that's um, the difference. So modern art would be like uh, in the West, in, in a Western context, uh, what artists in the 1950s in New York or 1940s were doing what certain artists in the 1950s and 1940s in certain parts of New York or, you know, London or Paris or whatever could be called modern art. So modernism is a uh, term that in different disciplines like architecture, painting, uh, literature has certain values associated with it and artists that prescribe to those values and who mm. were working with those values during that period when it became very popular. Like minimal, more industrial well, for, you know, for, it, it means different things for different um, okay. disciplines. Modernism and painting had to do with abstraction, mm. making work that was increasingly abstract. And there were critics and there were theorists who were writing about this in the f uh, f 40s and 50s. Um, and then artists who rebelled against that abstraction and made really, like, uh, messy, strange work, you know, not abstract, but referencing uh, popular culture, you could say that they're moving into postmodern art or art which is more contemporary. But essentially contemporary art, for me, for my purposes, is art that's being made by people now who are living now, who are making work now, okay. who are not. Yeah, so, so that's what I mean by contemporary art. Why do you think you do what you do? traveling in your suitcase, going around, meeting as many artists um, from various backgrounds as you can, try to tell their story. W where do you think that that curiosity stems from? Well, I, I would say because I'm, uh, I was homeschooled growing up, and that's a big part of who I am. Uh, I was homeschooled, I was unschooled, so I, I didn't learn. My parents sort of just let me play around, go around out in the woods. I grew up in the countryside. Uh, I didn't read until I was 11. I taught myself to read. So everything was always quite self-directed. Um, and so by the time... And so this project, just traveling around, meeting artists, gathering information, is self very self-directed. So how, how did you not know how to read until 11? I mean, it, did that not worry your parents? Um, and they it sort of gave them a sense of urgency to teach you the alphabets and try well, to teach you you know i uh had my mother always read to me so i grew up around stories every night she would read to me so i loved stories and there was a point when like 10 i was like wow i would love to be able to read i'd love to be able to write my own stories but i i i, I don't know how to write um, so th I became fascinated by learning, you know, the alphabet and my parents were very open-minded, uh, educationally. They had come from New York city. They had moved to the countryside. They had come from sort of elite prep schools and successful business oriented families, uh, of their own. I mean, their parents, um, and had really had a terrible time. And so they wanted to move to the countryside and do something very intentionally different and they had read a lot about alternative styles of education um, 
and homeschooling and unschooling and, and were doing things in a very intentional way, even if it appeared to be very unstructured. And it was in many ways unstructured, but it was unstructured because they believed that kids left to their own devices um, become, you know, motivated by their own curiosity and that's the best way for people to learn and learn at their own pace. So how long were you homeschooled for? What does a, a normal homeschooling kind of day look like? Well, I went to I went to high school I went to high school in sophomore year, so I was um, fifteen. So technically, I was homeschooled until then. Um, and uh. When I was younger, my mother organized a homeschooling group in our in our area. So once a week or twice a week, all the kids, all the homeschooling kids, would meet up and we would um, just play together out in the woods, be behind the um, the church that we rented to meet, to meet up at. M many homeschoolers are, are religious or Christian in the U.S. Um, my parents were not, um, but. Um, so there was some socializing with other homeschoolers, but often my days were very free and open, especially when I was younger, just playing off in the woods behind our house, um, building Legos, Playmobiles, um, loved Legos and Playmobiles. And then when I got to, you know, 10, 11, 12, I could start to read. I just read all day, every day and made lists of words that I liked. I carried around a little thesaurus and would always be looking up, you know, what's another word that I could use for this word? Um, and then when I was getting a bit older and then thinking about going into school, school, um, high school, uh, for just being around other kids my own age, I wanted a more structured environment. I, I, I was curious about learning other things that my parents didn't know how to teach. Um, so the kind of your pursuit of learning came purely from your sense of curiosity, nothing top down. Well, I think that um, eventually my parents started, you know, saying, oh, you need to learn a bit of math. You need to learn a bit of, uh, trying to remember. Um, but yeah, it was pretty, I guess talking to my parents would be a better person. You know, they would be better to, to talk about this than I am. My memory of those days is very, very open. There were workbooks, there were some, uh, I started having a tutor that would come over and help me with things uh, when I was older um, with math, um, preparing me to go into school. Um, but I think it was very, very different than what many kids have as their experience growing up. I think it was very, very different. And everyone I've spoken to who you know wasn't a homeschooler who I grew up with, everyone else out in the world when I talk about my upbringing, they're like, oh yeah, that sounds very strange. Sounds very different than what they had. But very self-directed. And that's why I think this project, which is something I've been working on for the past couple of years, but it might not be something that I'm always working on. Um, but I think the through line there is just like curiosity and sort of, uh, oh, I'm going to just go off and do this without it being part of a larger structure that is requiring me to do this or, you know, enabling me to do this. Do you have a sense of ultimate goal for, for this project? I'm trying to develop a certain format to, to share these conversations and a certain tone for the conversations where this very like, um, a conversational, casual, curious, open-ended tone for long format conversations with artists from this region or from these emerging art scenes. Um, 
and particularly oriented to their process and their sketches and their upbringing and their thoughts and then turning the, turning those conversations, turning those images and formal sort of archives into these really economical booklets which can be produced at different art centers um, in, a, in a really non-centered, economical, uh, ad hoc way. If there was a point where other people were invested enough in the project, other curators or researchers from the region, like I don't have to be doing these conversations myself. I'm doing them because other people aren't doing them. If other people were invested in the project to s start adding material to this library, this growing library, and there were art centers and art spaces that had you know, signed up to, uh, and there were enough art centers or art spaces in a network that had signed up to distribute them. Mm -hmm. If it became like self-sustaining and I could step away and people could just be having, you know, it could be like a sort of an alternative so publishing you, movement or practice that, it, well, you know, other people were at the, other people were, were co-creating, co-leading. So you see this more as like an open, open archive, open source sort of project. Yeah, eventually. For to contribute. Yeah, okay. but, but for me it's about sort of not not being so having a certain amount of intentionality or rigor about what you know what is the tone of these conversations what's the sort of direction what's the type of work that's being shown it's 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 an alternative to the academic um types of publications that exist it's an alternative to what the museums or galleries are trying to do so i'm trying to clearly define like oh this is what it is so it's not, it wouldn't be so open that anything is accepted, any type of conversation, you know what I mean? It, it needs to be like clearly defined, that territory. But then if other, and I'm constantly asking other folks to like help out and be a part of it. The issue is, as I've said earlier, like uh, the types of people who are most qualified, young, mid-career, curators, researchers, um, are the people who are most critical of the project and who say this is very unprofessional, you know, they are, you know, focusing on other types of work. Mm. I mean, they probably can't do what you do. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, I think it's weird for them also that I'm not trying to climb the ladder and like become a curator working at this museum, build going my way up. It's like my approach is like totally not career oriented, which is, I think, sort of... Um, I don't do a good job of trying to fit into the art world hierarchies, which I think is confusing for some people in the art world hierarchies. I'm not trying to like... Yeah, it'll be hard to believe you. So you have this archive, you're meeting all these interesting artists, um, fascinating artists that probably even the people in the the you know top of the food chain, the art industries are, are not even aware of. And, Certainly. And yet... Um, for for what uh just out of genuine curiosity and willingness to learn and to share stories and ultimately to yeah. make this into like an op open source archive for people to contribute and to and to learn about each other that sounds really um trustworthy you know that sounds really <laughs> that sounds really that makes sense you know are you, be, are you being sarcastic? I'm <laughs> being sarcastic. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't make sense. Um, like my my again, my background is in literature. It makes sense because I know you, but but people aren't like you, and so that's why it doesn't make sense. Well, I, I don't and know. You if are, in are a, like me or not like me. I would I would say that my my motives though are just like I'm interested in stories. I'm interested in people. This is an excuse for me to go around and meet different types of people, and hear different types of stories. Well people aren't like you because just how many people grew up with your cultural heritage and growing up in back of the woods of vermont in a you know uh a net zero yeah, you know so my, a home my house was off the electrical <laughs> grid it was uh before winter, it was a cool thing to do before it was a cool thing wind turbine solar panel uh, uh wood heated stove um didn't have any movies we didn't have a television growing up um so uh Oh, we didn't have TV. We had a tel We eventually got a television set. There was no reception, so we could get um, 
we could watch movies we could, we could watch v, uh, v, v videos VHS VHSs trying to yeah. remember that. VHSs <laughs> that we could rent at the video store but my mother sorry to go off on this little tangent but it may be interesting um, would get would rent VHSs but she did not like modern movies mm. and so we only got VHSs of musicals from the 1940s and 50s and so the only movies I watched growing up as a kid were musicals from the 40s and 50s and so my whole sort of view of you know what mainstream american culture was was mid-century american culture um and so i've always felt quite disconnected from mainstream american values or culture as you remember when i went to high school which is where we met i I wore suits every day um not because it was required but just because that was my idea of what you know a guy did uh you, you would wear a suit you know with ties um pocket squares, uh, hats. Um, what changed? Well, Southeast Asia was too hot. When I went to school in Singapore, it was so, so hot. <laughs> and then when I started traveling around for this project, I was living of out of a, a, mm. a carry-on suitcase, so I had to be really um, uh, light, light. You but know, that's uh, the same thing for me as after the Marine Corps, like whatever I, uh, sort of the clothings I wear, I always keep in mind that at, at any point I need to be battle ready. So I need to be able to be physical. You know, I like to take that into account every time. Uh, okay. Talking about mid-century, then we have to talk about... Well, and I'll just, I'll just add that that's also probably why I'm so comfortable being in Southeast Asia, uh, because I feel like I'm, I'm a foreigner in Southeast Asia, but in many ways I feel like I'm a foreigner in the U.S. I really do not hmm. feel like I... Uh, it's not like I walk around, you know... New York City or, or, or some town and feel like, oh, this is my culture, I'm here, I relate to the music, to the movies, to the I feel totally disassociated. Where do you feel do you feel at home anywhere? Uh except for your home, your net zero home where you were born and raised. Yeah. And- well I was just thinking about this the other day. I feel at home in uh, used bookstores. Oh. Anywhere in the world. I feel at home in art galleries anywhere in the world. Uh, and I feel at home in uh uh, you feel antique, at home at the, um, the Edinburgh Art Festival? <laughs> well, I... <laughs> well, that's not, an not art fair. That's not a museum. One. Okay. <laughs> that's a fair. I don't, I, yeah, I don't feel at home in art fairs. I okay, feel at home okay. in art museums. Or I just feel like I know how to, re- you know, I, n- I feel confident in passing some sort of judgment of like, oh, do I like this or do I not like this? Most places I'm just sort of walking around and totally like unsure of even what's going on. You know, when, when you ask people where, you know, the third culture kids were, uh, you know, kids growing up in cosmopolitan environments and you ask them where they feel most at home, they usually think about, you know, a country, a city, a place. And you said a bookstore. So any bookstore, anywhere in the world. I was well. I would say specifically used, used bookstores, book um, but because I I've started collecting books over COVID, I started collecting books, going out to used bookstores in New England. You know, because I'm from Vermont, there's amazing, amazing used bookstores, and the books didn't have to be in English; they could be um, in German, Italian, Chinese, whatever. But if I had amazing pictures, you know, hmm. I could collect. Uh, you know, I'm interested in that. What are the most important values to you in in life at this point in life sure i would say that i would say that um in high school i got really into the value of sincerity and trying to be sincere with myself and trying to be honest with myself and trying to sort of check in with myself and and not deceive myself i think self-deception is uh very very uh common and easy Uh, and so i really want to be honest with myself and then and then try to be honest with others and be honest with myself and with others as things change as i change or circumstances change so i think that's a value that is very important for me 
can we talk about your your grandparents talking sure. about the mid-century films that you were watching yeah so my grandfather who i never met because he died when my father was eight um was a photographer and he was a fashion and celebrity photographer in the 1950s and 1960s he did a lot of work with uh people like Audrey Hepburn, but also, you know, Dior, Chanel, Yves Saint Laurent. He took pictures of artists like Picasso and Matisse. He did a lot of work for Time, uh, for Life magazine. And, but he's probably most known for his work with the Kennedys. He was a, a friend and sort of unofficial personal photographer for uh, JFK and, and Jackie. Um, so my parents, when they moved to the countryside from New York, they needed to, 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 to have me to build a house to sort of start this alternative existence. They needed a job that could allow them to work from home. And so they started um, building the uh, estate and archive, uh, which again relates to my interest in archives, I suppose. Uh, of my grandfather whose images had he'd sort of he owned the rights to his images but when he died quite young um everybody forgot about him and so they started a business that was like promoting him uh selling his uh working with galleries to sell his images and then licensing his images to magazines and, and whatnot because there are many iconic photos so uh yeah that's my grandfather my grandmother his wife who is still alive and who i saw in new york a couple weeks ago um she's pat suzuki pat suzuki she's she's nisei she's uh she was born in california but she's japanese and she was a broadway star uh first broadway star Asian Broadway star on the cover of Time magazine. And I think first Asian person on the cover of Time magazine. I don't no? No, I can't imagine. I don't know. Really? Probably like Mao was the first. <laughs> um, anyway, she was, she, yeah, sort of like this path breaking Asian um, Broadway celebrity in the 50s, I guess. Was it the 50s? Yeah, it must have been the 50s. Um, but she doesn't talk about the past. Like, I'll try to ask her about. She has all sorts of crazy stories. We I do suspect we a three-way conversation. But with that. she is very. She's ninety-four now. Ninety-four, really? ninety-three. She's full of no. energy. She's very lively, but she's very mischievous, and you know, will only allude to people that she knew, and like, make some sort of comment about how, you know. Um, what the Kennedys were like, or make some sort of comment about what, um, um, who's the singer who had famously blue eyes, who did Fly Me to the Moon. What, Frank Sinatra? Yeah, Frank Sinatra, these different, you know, she knew all these people. Yeah, of course, she sang she, with them. So yeah, that, that that's, those are my, those are two of my four grandparents. What is she like as a, as your, as a grandmother? Well, she's not very good with kids. So I, my relationship with her started when, and by not very good, I mean she just is uninterested in kids. So my relationship with her started probably when I was 17, 18, started going into the city, Say. into New York, and then staying at her apartment. Um, but she's a very dynamic and charismatic, you know, she's a star. She's a star. So she's very cool. She's a very cool person. I'm always so excited to spend time with her. Um, but she sort of does her own thing. She's not a grand, she's not a grandmotherly type. She's not, she's not baking cookies. So do you think she would, um, do a show with us, three of us together? Probably, uh, probably not. But she said, okay, to singing with me, right? That's uh, singing a jazz. She, you know, she said all sorts of things. She says all sorts of things. She says all, her famous line is uh, "fuck them if they can't take a joke." That's her like, that's an, that's her quote from my ninety-year-old grandmother. But yeah, no, she's 
she would be gold. Everything she says is, yeah, is like a highlight for a uh, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, work on it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be there. Come when, is, when is the Putney? Uh... The 7th, 8th, 9th of June. We should have some sort of disclaimer below the interview that I'm just recovering from COVID, hence why I'm so tired. Sure. All right. It's been a pleasure, Juno-san. Thank you for coming down to my humble couch and staying with us here in London town before I have to fly off. And for the record, I'm recovering from COVID. So thank you for putting your life on the line to <laughs> I'm COVID make this Bujok. content. Can't get COVID anymore. Thank you very much, Hunter. Safe travels next few months. And then when do I see you next? Probably be back in uh, April. April. Okay, well, it's, then it's your turn come to up come to up. to Edinburgh. Okay. Certainly. Right, brother. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you. What is this? Is what? A British? British salute? <laughs> okay, we're gonna look here and then just smile. Thumbnail. No, the Buddhist, the one of the. Together, in a heart. Oh. <laughs>